This is 2004, 2005, 2006. Okay, so you're, you, you're in your early 20s at this point. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. also... I was, in, I was indicted when I was 23 going on 24, so... Okay, so I you're very to, young. This is all between 19 and 24, everything I just described. Got you. How difficult... Well, two things, a couple of things stand out to me. You're shipping it. You go from, you know, your, your, your cousins and your friends flying small packages as much as they can carry to now you're shipping this. Mm -hmm. uh, FedEx, UPS, DHL. You're in federal territory at this point. Yeah, if, which I didn't know, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How difficult was it to get some of those drivers on your team? You'll be surprised what somebody who's making forty thousand dollars would do, right? So you know, if somebody's making forty thousand dollars a year, and you can turn that forty thousand dollars a year to a hundred thousand a year, one hundred fifty thousand a year. You'll be surprised. I mean, you know, the drivers that we had. I mean, those guys were. And this was funny. This is interesting because this led to the issues. But so the first problem is getting the drugs to where you want them to go. The next problem is getting the money back from where it is back to where it started. So that created its own challenges of getting money back because again, you have the same issues. You have people stealing it, you have law enforcement compensating it, and then you have to try to get it undetected, particularly when you have large volumes of small bills. So when you have you know, $100,000 in 20s, 5s, 10s, and 50s, that's a, that's a big fucking, that's a lot of paper, so to speak, right? So it's a lot of space. So it just, we had to come up with ways. So it, it turned out to we would buy VCRs from Walmart, take all the guts out, fill the VCR so it's around the same weight, and then put them back in the boxes like they wouldn't touch and then ship them so people look at it, the VCR, they pass it through. Um, and but then there's even times when it's last minute, I would fly to Tampa, you know, fly back with money, and that's when I learned that all the scanning systems that they have at the airport, even though they can see money, they never know the denomination. So they would see a hundred grand, but they would say, oh, how much money is it? I'll say 10. And then most people, they don't, they don't know the difference. So I would have no problem flying through. Um, and then, you know, so those were the two ways to get the money back. But then the other problem that money creates is when, when everyone starts making money, their habits change. And it's just inevitable. People's habits change. And when people's habits change, it's the beginning of the end. <laughs> so, <laughs> so your habits change, you get it in. So now you have guys who, you know, were driving to work at FedEx with, you know, their, you know, maybe a Lexus or um, a nice uh, new model Explorer or something like that. You know, re you know, a relatively, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollar car, and and you know, then you know they pull up a few weeks later, a few months later, in brand new Porsche trucks with twenty four inch rims on them and <laughs> things like that. And people start asking questions like, "Hey, how how we make the same thing? We drive, work for the same business. How are you driving a Porsche truck and I'm still in the same Honda Civic that you was driving, you know, a couple months ago? Something's different." And all was the beginning of the end. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Do you remember that fateful day? When it all came crashing down? Don't forget. You don't forget. Talk to me so, about that day. Everything is, in, in, before you even answer that, what type of money are we talking? You're talking a lot of yeah, I mean, I mean, at any given time, at any given, I mean, we was, we was in the millions. At any given time, you know, transit-wise, there will be 500 or so pounds going back and forth. So five, and then each pound, we would sell for about 1,000 bucks. And we wanted to give it away about 900 bucks. So, you know, you're talking about, you know, $500,000 transacting back and forth every few weeks. So, you know, we went through millions through that period of time. A percentage of that is lost um, and a percentage of that a lot of you taking you flip and keep your own back and forth. And so, you know, it was, it was just a lot of cash going back and forth. Um, were you disciplined yourself? I know you said other people's habits changed. Did yours? Yeah. So what's interesting is that my habits did change. So I, I became known in Vegas as just this quiet guy that just was always in the clubs and just always had money and always had us, but no one really knew where I lived. Um, no, I didn't, I didn't bring the attention to myself where 
people were close. People didn't really, I would just pop up and disappear, pop up and disappear, pop up and disappear. That's kind of- But, but I, are you I'm driving close. expensive cars? Or are you, are you yeah. moving with yeah. different women? I owned, I owned businesses at the time. So I had a window tinting shop that I owned at the time. I had, a, I had, because the traffic got so much with shipping stuff, I bought a shipping store so that I could ship stuff from my own shipping store without having to worry about going to other stores. So I had, so a lot of, a lot of the success, even my own family didn't know what I was doing. So my, my, everyone would attribute what they saw as what I was making from my businesses because I had two businesses running at the time. Got you. Very smart. So you, you started your own shipping business. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the volume got too big. We had to have our own. Okay. Asked you earlier, talk to me about that fateful day. Because yeah. it always, at some point, it always ends. It does. And I think that's, that's the problem with selling drugs is that you can never do 100% of it by yourself, right? Not if you can make real money. So you always have to buy it from someone. You have to sell it to someone. And just those two interactions is enough to get you jammed up. Because you're talking to this person over here, and you don't know what they have going on 100%. You got to deal with this person over here, you don't know what they have going on 100%. That's enough to, to break the whole chain. Because you don't know which one's going to be the weak link in the chain. And that's essentially what happened just on a larger scale. So, you know, what, um, how it started is two key things happened. Our Connect's driver, again, ties to money, felt like he wasn't making as much money as he should. So he started doing side deals and dealing with another group outside of who my Connect knew and who we knew. Because we was really, really, really close. And we was making so much money together, we didn't want to do business with anyone else. I didn't want to do business with anyone else. He didn't want to do business with anyone else. And that was our way of protecting ourselves, right? So that was part of the strategy, which worked for a while. However, he wasn't paying all the people in the team well, right? I don't know how he's paying them. It's none of my business, but he's not taking care of his team and his team wants to eat a little bit more. So his team now starts striking side deals on the side. So when his, when his driver starts doing side deals on the side, that driver gets jammed up on a bad deal. So the first person that driver tells on is the connect, right? Now this all happens simultaneously, so that's step one. The second thing is one of the UPS drivers I mentioned earlier who was going to work in a Porsche truck. They start questioning him, they put the pressure on him. Like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? They start following him on his routes. They get him on tape, taking boxes off his truck, ripping the labels off and handing them to unknown people, right? Not delivering them, right? Which is what we would do. So they put him in the room and jam him up. So now in Arizona slash, so you have ICE, which is Immigration is Custom Enforcement in Arizona. Then you have DEA in Florida. And they both now have cases open for these two individuals, but they don't know they're connected yet. So as they start connecting the dots, then it turns into a joint task force with ICE was on my case, DA was on my case, Pinellas County Sheriff's Department was on my case, and Las Vegas Metro Police Department was on my case. They all came together and, and all the, the, they realized that, okay, this is the same group. The driver here is getting the, the weed has come from the driver from the West Coast, and then the West Coast is connected to this other wrecks that we made earlier this month, right? So once that connection was made, they started just watching. They, they was able to figure out everyone on the Florida side, but no one could find me because, you know, I didn't have a house in my name. I lived super, 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 super low-key, right? So they wasn't able to tie where it was coming from from Vegas because I would send it to random addresses, and then I would tell people where to be, and when to be there at the last minute. I need to give people information ahead of time, right? So it was a very last minute thing, but I did it on purpose. I just didn't want to float around, et cetera. And it gave me some level of control too, if I need to switch stuff up. So um, one day, you know, my boy, D, you know, was super close and um, we was basically partners in all of this. Um, he would call me every morning because I had just sent a package of money down there that had came from up here. So I just sent a packet, I don't know, it was like maybe a hundred, hundred fifty dollars, something like that. And I didn't hear nothing back, which is unlike, unlike him. Like he's super on point and we were doing this for some years and we never missed one of our check-in calls. And we just had, we always rotate our burner phones and stuff like that. And I couldn't get a hold of him. And that's how I started feeling weird. I was like, damn, it's, it's weird that I'm not hearing from him. I said, okay, cool. I'm not gonna stress out about it. I go to my, um, I go to my mail store I said, you know, my normal routine, I go to my mail store and I'm actually um, uh, going to the mail store uh, to ship out. I have like maybe 50 or 60 pounds in the trunk that I didn't ship out the day before that's still in my trunk that I'm going to ship out that day. So I get to the mail store. 
I get out and I start talking to my girlfriend um, who was already there. And just because I'm running my mouth, I didn't take the boxes out. So it's still in my trunk. And while we're, <laughs> so while we're talking, it's like a glass storefront from both sides. You see all these windbreakers just walking through and then they come into the door, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's like 20 people. <laughs> 20 so, so, people. so you're on the phone talking to your girl at this point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is so all the real, because I could just imagine looking through this glass window. At what point are you saying to yourself, damn? Yeah, then it clicked. Real. I was this like, happening. Uh, you know, at the time, I realized that I have a very high tolerance for risk. So even then, I always felt like I could talk my way out of this, right? Like, you know, say so that. So I still feel like that, right? <laughs> so I'm, like, uh, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say. I'm thinking about what I'm trying to preempt and know, try to figure out what they know so I can try to see how I'm going to re respond, right? So that's what my brain is doing, like, okay, trying to preempt. So they come in, and this actually wasn't where I got arrested. This is actually where they did the search warrant. So they came in, and they said, you know, we have a search warrant to search the place, blah, blah, blah. The head investigator, cocky white guy, he came, he was young, he was probably my age, a little bit older than me, probably about five, six years older than me. And he was like, he took some head handcuffs, he waved it in front of me. He was like, yeah, you got to pay these in your future. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then, so then, um, so then they search, they searched my mail store. They couldn't find nothing because, again, I was very disciplined in how I did things. And what I'm thinking is, is like, fuck, the weed is in my trunk. I hope they don't have a search warrant for my car. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.